I hope it's okay with you if I start out with a bit of humor. As you all know, um, this is the time of the year in most UU churches where members and friends and participants in the life of the church are being canvassed for pledges of financial commitment so that the staff and lay leaders can budget responsibly for the coming year. As you might expect, this can be an anxious time for ministers and church leaders as pledges trickle in and we wait to see whether the response will allow us to fund all we hope to fund in next year's budget. In most churches, the minister is expected to offer at least one stewardship sermon, often called the Sermon on the Amount, (laughs) to, to inspire generosity. And in some churches, the minister gives a second stewardship sermon, the the sermon on the rest of the amount. (laughs) Like I said, it can be an anxious time. And knowing that humor can relieve a bit of the tension, a colleague of mine posted a question in a ministers-only Facebook group. What is your shadow canvas sermon title? In other words, what sermon title would you like to use? Even though that you would ne- even though you know you would never actually use that title. Nearly 100 responses later, here are some of the better and appropriate <laughs> titles. All right, here's one. "Pennies from Heaven" is only a song. <laughs> Our faith in the miraculous is only evident at pledge time. We have all the money we need as soon as you pledge it. Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes-Benz? Just because Christians do it doesn't mean you can't. The sermon is in the mail. And um, 50 shades of green. And... uh, so a lot of them were inappropriate, but would you, would you like an inappropriate one? This is, uh, all right, uh, yeah, so, so one, minister, one minister said that, that, that she really wants to title hers, I upped my pledge, up yours. <laughs> all right. I mentioned, I mentioned this humor um, because the stewardship team actually vetoed my sermon title for this morning when I told them that I was thinking of using the title Church is for Weirdos as my, as my Canvas sermon title. And uh, I think it was one of the members of, of the stewardship team who looked at me and said, and said better stick with Stronger Together, Tom. <laughs> but there's a thread. There's a thread that runs through all five Sundays this month, a thread that can be summed up with that, with that phrase that there is something a weirdness that happens in church or religion or spirituality. Or to put it a little bit differently, all this month I'm going to be talking about ways in which church or religious community or faith or spirituality can be avenues of active resistance against the world as it is, can be forces allowing us to resist the status quo, subvert the dominant paradigm, or challenge the prevailing culture, to disrupt or weird the way in which we live our lives. Next week in our multi-generational service, we're going to be looking at different images of God, of the divine, and different ways of imagining God that challenge conventional understandings. The following week, I'm going to be doing something um, a little bit different. I'm going to take a famous sermon from our tradition, Theodore Parker's Sermon on the Transient and Permanent, which was from 1843, and remix the sermon so that it speaks in our contemporary context here in 2015. Parker's sermon was all about holding on to what is truly most important and eternal and not treating things that are meant to change and meant to fade away as if they are eternal. This is needed wisdom in a culture that invests so much energy into triviality. The following week, I'm going to give a sermon about singing. The sermon's going to be called, Why Do We Sing? About the experience of singing together. And it's it's based on the realization that many people in our society go an entire year without ever singing with other people. It's going to be a sermon about civic participation and and the decline of civic participation and why it's important for us to sing together, to work together. Even singing together can be a subversive activity. 
And finally, the fifth Sunday in March, our service will we'll celebrate Passover and the exodus from Egypt, and we'll talk about liberation, liberation from the oppressions in the world in which we live. This direction may be surprising for some of us. After all, in our times, religion and church are usually regarded not as forces for, you know, being subversive or countercultural or, or challenging the status quo. They're, they're seen as forces that are almost anchors weighing us back from changes that we have to make. But when I talk about church as being weird, when I talk about church as being subversive, here is what I mean. Peter Morales, the president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, writes the following about the society in which we live right now. He writes, Americans today are the most isolated people in human history. According to one study, almost half of all Americans now have either no one or only one other person with whom they can even discuss important matters. This number has almost doubled in 20 years. These are not dull, abstract numbers. They are a cry of isolation, of pain, of loneliness. Americans are far lonelier than they were even a generation ago. Loneliness is among us like a silent epidemic. And Morales observes, this is not at all how we were meant to be in the world. He continues, we need one another. You and I, we're relational creatures. We're hardwired that way. It is in relationship that we become fully human. It is in relationship that we find fulfillment. Only when we transcend our individuality do we touch the divine. So Anne and Lydia and I, we on Thursday morning this week, we woke up to having had the electricity go out in our house at 1 o'clock at night. And the first person to offer a warm place to stay was a fellow member of the church. How many times in a given week or month does this church and its community break through isolation that we might find in our living? How many of you would count other people in this community as one of those people in your life who you could turn to for shelter or turn to? Yeah, I didn't even ask for hands, but the hands go up. Yeah. There are other ways that we challenge the status quo. For example, our dominant culture segregates people by age. Children go to school with other children. Young adults live amongst other young adults their same age. Elders live with other elders in retirement communities. But church culture often gathers a multi-generational community together for worship or fellowship or service. So I see a play that the church puts on where our teens and adults are acting together or I see the UU Buddies program in the, in the Jones Building with uh, children in religious education meeting with their adult buddies. Or we come to a Friday fellowship dinner and I see something happening that rarely happens in our dominant culture. I know, I remember when I was a college student, just how meaningful it was. I was part of a campus ministry at a small UU fellowship in, in Portland, Oregon. And uh, a leader of that church invited all of the UU campus students over to her house for a home-cooked meal. And... Um, it was there kind of in, in her living room, sitting around, that I realized that, you know, it had been months since I had even last eaten with somebody who, you know, was more than two years older than me or two years younger than me, that, that this, this multi-generational community was what, was what was missing. Something beautiful and transformative happens when we break down walls of separation. Our dominant culture believes in being constantly distracted and stimulated. Many of us live our lives constantly in front of screens, checking social media, tweeting, living within the solipsism of our earphones. But church culture is subversive. It takes time out, whether it's observing a Sabbath or sitting for 60 seconds of silent meditation in the sanctuary. We know the importance of stepping back from the noise of the world. I once had someone tell me, that those moments of silence after the prayer were the only time during the week of unstructured silence in her life. Did you make that time a little bit longer? She said, I need it. So when the church hosts a spiritual retreat or a family retreat at Shelter Neck or when I meet with the youth group and, and they're not all glued to their smartphones with the earbuds in, 
there is some resistance to dominant culture going on. That connection can even be subversive. By the way, speaking of cell phones, I, I heard there was a rumor that got started that, that I was on my cell phone during the church service. Um, I heard this. Somebody said, Tom, Tom's, Tom's on his cell phone. And the rumor was that I was like texting or, or playing Candy Crush on, on my cell phone. And so I want to I say this, the truth is, if you ever see me up here with my, with my cell phone, um, it's on airplane mode, it's because I'm checking the time. Is that my, we don't, I don't wear a watch. This is, this is like my clock. And we don't have a clock in here. And so I don't know how the time's going. And, and we don't have a clock in the commons either, so I don't know when the service is going to start without the cell phone. And we don't have a clock in the Jones building anywhere where you can actually see it. And, and if we want the services to actually start on time and end on time, um, then, then I need to check my phone. Or, or, I suppose, or I suppose we could buy a clock for in here, which is... <laughs> It's, it's pledge season, after all. We've got lofty ambitions. Our dominant culture teaches us that our worth is equal to what we can earn, what we can buy, what we can produce, and what we can consume. There is a chasing after status that tells us that producing and consuming is what makes us worthy. But church culture declares our worth is not dependent on how much money we have or what we are able to buy. This was a lesson that that Jesus in the community that he built up taught, that our our worth is, is not to be found in what society values us at. And likewise, in our own Unitarian Universalist church, we teach that we all have inherent worth and dignity, that we are, we are, our worth is not related to to what we can do or what we can purchase. In the reading from earlier this morning, Anne Lamott talks about her own experience of meeting the people of her funky little church, a Presbyterian church in the Bay Area. In that community, she tells us she feels her own life changing, leaning in the direction of a bit more purpose, heart, balance, gratitude, and joy. She talks about some measure of existential loneliness and isolation being lessened, being reduced that church is the place where if you show up, they have to let you in. She talks about the light of others in community, helping her not to have to make her way by the glimmer of her own little candle. These things may seem rather simple and rather obvious, but in fact, they are subversive in their challenge to the world in which we live. I guess one way would be to say that church is for weirdos, Of course, the stewardship team would have me articulate that a little bit differently. They'd say that, no, we're actually stronger together. My dear mentor, John Burens, um, repeatedly used the same sermon illustration to make a point about the world in which we live. John talks of going to the mall in December to do a bit of shopping before the holidays, and in uh, so, it's, so it's there, and everybody is, is, is hectic and, and frenzied and, and rushing around and is trying to get the shopping done. And in the bustle of shopping, he notices a teenage boy strutting through the throng of shoppers, headphones on, dressed in kind of a, a punk rock style, oblivious to the chaos around him. The young man's T-shirt was emblazoned with a slogan, Only you can prevent narcissism. (laughs) John, my my mentor, would then go on to talk about how how narcissism or radical self-centeredness has become so much of the default setting in our society. David Foster Wallace commented on this. He put it, the spiritual struggle this way. He said, everything in my own immediate evidence supports my deep belief that I am the absolute center of the universe, the realist, most vivid, and important person in existence. We rarely think about this sort of natural, basic self-centeredness because it is so socially repulsive, but it's pretty much the same for all of us, he writes. It's our default setting, hardwired into our boards at birth. Think about it. There is no experience you have ever had that you've not been the absolute center of. Since the days of Copernicus and Galileo, we've, we've known that we are not the center of all things, that the world does not, in fact, revolve around us. But psychologically and spiritually and socially, 
we may live in pre-Copernican days. After all, it was that, that book, I think Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, that said that at base, at base, the motive force, the motive organizing principle for how we are in the world is a sense of our own selfishness. Marilyn Robinson, favorite author of mine, writes about teaching a college creative writing course at the University of Iowa um, in that distinguished program there, and that, and that over her decades of teaching, she's noticed a trend in fiction writing, which is that the students who write of uh, characters, that, that increasingly they are unable to imagine characters motivated by anything other than selfishness and self-centeredness. That that, that that is the trend in the fiction writing, and she, she mourns that. I remember some time ago befriending a young community organizer um, uh, organizing in this, this wonderful um, community organizing nonprofit, CCO, Communities Creating Opportunity. Communities Creating Opportunity. Um, uh, her name was Joy. Um, she was doing this before uh, going, in, going to rabbinical school. Um, and, and one of the, the organizing principles in this community organizing was that self-interest is what motivates us. And, and she believed this. I remember we'd go out for, for lunch together, and we, we, we would argue. And I would, I would say, no, I, it, we, there has to be something other than self-interest that, that motivates us. That's not how. And she'd say, no, that is, that's how the world is. That's how the world is organized. That's how our, that's what we're called communities creating opportunity. We're not, we're not called you know, selfish communities. And she disagreed with me. And, and I, I like this. So you should never be the hero of your own story, but in this story, I actually win, and she's and she changes her mind. So I, I like to tell that story because um, she goes um, she goes with a uh, with a with a Jewish group that travels to a, um, a a third world country to do relief work, and and comes back and 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 we go to out to lunch afterwards, and she says, I'm, I'm beginning to rethink this idea that that selfishness is the central organizing principle. Um, which is, which is interesting because in, in church, in church community, that's not the central organizing principle, or it, it can't be, or we better hope it's not, or else we're in trouble. Here is the place where we, where we, what, we draw the circle wide so no one stands alone, that we stand side by side. And so whether this title is Churches for Weirdos or whether it's we're stronger together or whether it's no one stands alone. That's a little bit of what stronger together means to me. It's a little bit of a sense of, of why this community and church communities are important. And thank you for your attention. Thank you for your, your excellent church, church personship, church, church personship this morning and coming out on this, uh, on this uh, dreary day out there. Thank you for being here.